pressure inside the camera returns to atmospheric pressure and the gas inlet is then hermetically sealed. The first picture identifies the borehole and the date to ensure that the eventual photographs are compared with cores from the same hole. The operator checks the dials to make sure the camera controls are working properly and then the camera is lowered in the drill hole at a rate of about seven feet per minute. The camera is suspended from the lowering mechanism by electrical cable covered by steel wire. The steel wire is wound and overlapped so that the cable doesn't twist during the lowering of the camera. Otherwise, the camera would, of course, rotate. The cable can withstand a tension of about 2,700 pounds. Pictures are, in fact, taken as the camera is pulled up, since the cable tension is more constant and the camera is steadier. Here, in this animation, the camera is passing a fracture. The control for the flash and the film advance are connected to a hand crank, and the operator controls the movement and the rate at which the photographs are taken. Here, the camera has passed the fracture, having photographed it. About 75 feet of drill hole can be photographed each time before the camera needs to be reloaded. By simultaneously comparing the core samples and the corresponding photographs, geologists can determine the characteristics of the underlying rock. The film, or the photographs, uh, appear rather like donuts because of the shape of the mirror. Usually the comparison of core and photographs confirms what was found and already known from the core. But sometimes it does disclose fractures which were lost during the drilling. For example, if the rock is very, very fractured, then no core can be brought up, and the orientation of the fracture is lost. In addition, the core alone cannot very accurately show orientation of rock fractures and faults and bedding planes and so forth, but such orientation can be measured on the photographs. Notes on the location of the photograph in the core and the degree of oxidization of the fracture and any material filling the fracture are also made by the geologist as he looks at the photographs and the core samples. The information is transcribed on an angle plotter and calculations have to be made to compensate for the angle of dip and the strike of the beds in the borehole. The orientation of the camera has to be carefully noted. And the series of corrections eventually allow the data to be plotted. The technique that you've just seen is rather more used in determining the structure beneath proposed dam sites, for example, than in the search for ore deposits. But nevertheless, it's an interesting variation on a miner's technique, so to speak. Now, once one's discovered what might be an ore body, one of the next steps, which is very important, is to recognize just how much ore one's got. And that's easily done if you can see the ore. But in this sample, for example, which is a, from a copper mine, a producing copper mine, the copper simply is not visible. And it's very important, then, to be able to do detailed chemical analysis in order to discover just what and how much ore one's got. Remember that it's atoms which are the smallest discrete particle of an element. The smallest particle of aluminum or the smallest particle of iron is an atom. And that atoms differ from one another according to their internal structure. At the very center of an atom is the nucleus, composed of neutrons and of protons. The protons having a positive charge, the neutrons having no charge, and together the nucleus makes up the main mass of the atom. And around the nucleus, the electrons circulate. 
the number of electrons exactly matching the number of protons. And atoms bound together make up such elements as this beryllium. And each element then differs according to the number of protons. So lithium has three protons, but it can have three or four neutrons. And this makes up two kinds of lithium atoms, one with mass six and one with mass seven. In other words, the atoms differ in their weight. These are isotopes of lithium. We call them lithium six and lithium seven. And of many elements, there are several kinds of isotopes. Silicon 28, silicon 29, 30, for example. Now, atoms can, can occur in many different forms, both as a component of crystals, where they occur in combination, or, in this case, pure copper, where there are only copper atoms. Very often, when we're looking for ore, they occur only in very small concentrations. And careful metallurgical processes are necessary to concentrate the ore so that it can be extracted. Here, the grains of an important metallic ore are being separated. Often, smelting is necessary in order to get the important atoms of an element out of the ore. Some of these procedures are very complex because sometimes the ore is only present in very small quantities. This is the amount of gold from one ton of ore, very much less than an ounce. It's important to know just how much of an element, an important element like gold, for example, in gold ore, how much is present. That's quite easy with a sample if it's only composed of one kind of atom. If all the ore were composed all of gold, it would be an easy matter to determine how much there was. But when the ore or the sample we're interested in consists of a variety of atoms, then it's very much more difficult to find out just how much of a particularly interesting material there is in a sample. To analyze the sample, the first thing we must do is to separate the atoms one from another. Now, does their weight allow us then to determine how much of a different atom or of different atoms is present in the sample? So you can see here in this model experiment, weight alone doesn't help. But if we add a magnetic core to our little model apparatus and a magnet, then we find the key to the way we may be able to separate individual atoms of elements in a mixture. Here, the deflection produced by the magnet differs. Let's look at that again. It differs because the attraction of the magnet on the metallic core is the same, but the momentum of the ball going down the slope is greater if the ball is large and heavy than it is if the little model atom is small and light. So the larger and heavier the atom, the straighter its path and the less deflection by the magnet. And there, three different model atoms are separated according to their weight and the attraction of the magnet on their magnetic core. Now that can be applied to actual atoms if we subtract or add an electron to the electrons which circulate around the nucleus. That then makes the atoms susceptible to a magnetic field. Now we can do that. We can add or subtract an electron in a variety of ways depending on the substance. In this case, the substance is mounted in a vacuum chamber, 